Welcome to Wear Gaming Weekly for the week of March 13th, 2019. My name is Nick, and alongside me is my brother Josh. Say hi, Josh. Hi, Josh. For your information, Wear Gaming Weekly posts every Wednesday on YouTube.com and on podcast services, and you can find more about us at weargaming.com, or you can watch us stream live on twitch.tv slash weargaming underscore, like I did last night. Yes. Last night, I stayed up for about five hours, well, uh, more like six, but I streamed for five and a half hours, mm-hmm. uh, the Division 2, and man, that game is friggin' awesome. Yeah. And I had so much fun. Uh, I had a few viewers coming in and out, and I really appreciated them coming in and uh, watching, and I tell you, it's hard. Is it? You, uh, not, sorry, the streaming part, not oh. the game. Well, there are times where the game is hard, but as someone who, you know, we're just getting into this, you yeah. know. Uh, before I, the idea of even like having someone watch me play a game sounds about as ridiculous. Well, can sound about as ridiculous as it sounds, but mm-hmm. um, you never think about the energy that it goes to where you just got to keep that momentum going mm-hmm. at all time. And there were lulls and I'm like, what if this, this 15 seconds that I'm not talking or I'm like focusing on the game right? is the 15 seconds where a bunch of people are like, Oh, let's go. Oh, well, he's not. He's not. Anything. He's not doing anything. It's so, boring. Yeah, and so it was probably. Or you like, watch me just go. Uh, we got to figure out the t- better TV yeah, thing. Yeah. I, just, I look like just mad. I was making fun of myself. It looked like a bad character creator. Like, what's wrong with your eyes? Yeah. It, it was yeah. just, just because we got to look up at the screen. We're yeah. the stream. We get you know. Yeah, we set up the TV to be like a confidence monitor, and then it just so happened we're like, oh, well, we, we can stream in here. We got everything. So. Uh, we're working on it, but uh, I had a lot of fun, and if you're interested in uh, watching us play The Division 2 or several other games, yeah, uh, just uh, tune in to, again, twitch.tv slash wearegaming underscore. Um, and if you're interested, we also are looking for people who want to play with us yeah. and start up a squad. So hit us up on Twitter, at wearegaming underscore, and we would love to have you there. Absolutely. Um, um, and if you want to be a part of the show, you can write into weekly at wearegaming. Um, so yeah, anything else you want to plug? I don't think so. Let's get into the who, what, and where. All right. Starting us off, E3 is going to be a show? Maybe. EA will not be hosting a press conference at E3 2019. This is from Liam Liam Croft over at Push Square. Now this is slightly misleading because EA hasn't really been at E3 for years. But uh, the, the, the idea is there. If they're still there in that E3 week. They're capitalizing on the E3. They're in the same area. They're process. doing a press conference during the E3 sh- show time. Yeah. So. so let's see what Liam has to say over at Push Square. EA has today announced that it, alongside with Sony, will not be hosting a pre E3 2019 conference at this year's expo. Instead, the publisher plans to host multiple live streams across the 7th and 8th of June. Um, focusing on a variety of different games. The blog post reads, It all it all starts this year on Friday night, the, June 7th, 2019, with an all-new EA Play kickoff event. We're skipping the press conference this year and replacing it with multiple live streams that will air during the first two days of the event, bringing you more of what you told us you want, more gameplay and insights from the teams making the games. What it... While it is another loss for E3, it is not like we're missing out on too much. EA Play event these past few years have been notoriously... Well, this is the opinion of the writer. Uh, saying they've been notoriously bad uh, with a ton of sports-related filler and a little in the way of big announcements. Still, we'll miss the buildup of the anticipation that makes way for inevitable disappointment. This, so. this isn't a big deal. Like, um, it, the... It says EA Play events have been notoriously bad, but EA's press conference has never been great. Right. It's, uh, you know, there's always that sports. Mm-hmm. Because I, sports I, I is hate, their, I hate painting the, the sports. Like, I have sport, done it. Yeah. But painting the sports section is like, oh, it's just a sports section. But, like, that, those are EA's, like, biggest money Yeah, makers. that's right. So, I mean, it makes sense that they want to play to those strengths. Mm-hmm. But those people are going to buy Madden or FIFA Regardless of whether they're at the show or not. Absolutely. So um, I, I think this is going to let them streamline it better. It gives them less chance to lose. I yeah. mean, people love to hate EA mm-hmm. for what, you know, for many reasons, you know, understandable and some overblown. But 
I just think it gives them a way to let let the game speak for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, it does kind of you know some of the best moments of E3 uh, EA's press conferences are when they do the weird little things where yeah. they let creators like uh, uh, Joseph um, Ferris Ferris who did a uh, a way out. Yeah, a way out, and uh, brothers, and mm-hmm. uh, you have uh, unravel, right. and things like that. You don't get to see that on the stage as much, and, but you know they don't want to show it off like that either. Yeah, it is. It's kind of uh, in in that vein. I didn't think about it that way. It's kind of maybe a catch twenty uh, two, because uh, what I think this will lead to is a more like, I mean, if like for us as as longtime fans of E three, even before we you know were into gaming like we are today, like into yeah. the knowledge of it. We always were either making sure we were off or, mm-hmm. you know, we set aside the week, the, the three or four days that EA's press, con- you know, the E3's press conferences were. Yeah. And did all that. So on one hand, you know, that's, it, it's disappointing that things like that aren't happening. Sure. But, um, it, uh, it allows us to, um, I think what it'll allow us to do, to do, it's like you look at the schedule. They're doing these live streams. Mm-hmm. They'll probably like the week of, or maybe there'll be some like surprises. But there'll probably be like, oh, we're going to be talking about Anthem today, or we're going to be talking about the state of Star Wars or Star sure. Wars Fe- Jedi Fallen Order. So you know when you want to tune in. And then if they're doing FIFA or or Madden or yeah, something, people can go watch that and know what they're getting into. Not they're not waiting. And if you're not interested in that, you're not going to see it. So. Right. So I think it, it'll ultimately win out on you know the anticipation it won't be like the last uh, two years ago where they did the 30 minute um um battlefront 2 uh oh. story now granted it was after it was it technically was after, after the, the show first, but yeah. it was all it was, it was very weird um mm-hmm. but anyway so we're keeping a look at it for that so now that makes uh, playstation's not going to be there e3 is or sorry ea is they're going to be there, be there, but they're not going to do it. As far as the press conferences go, we don't have PlayStation and we don't have EA. Um, Nintendo still does their Direct, yeah, which is not a press conference. It's just like a press release. Yeah. Um, so all we're left with is Bethesda, Ubisoft, and, X, uh, and Microsoft. And Devolver. R- Devolver well, will Devolver, be there. <laughs> D- Devolver will do their thing, which is always just bad shit crazy. <laughs> Um, and so, um, that'll probably be nice for the press, mm-hmm. uh, less shows to cover, more time between them. Yeah. Um, I think there's, uh, going to be a showcase. That kind of funny showcase. The kind of funny showcase. They were yeah. talking about doing that again. So we'll probably see something like that. A bunch of indies. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, I, I was hearing like on Reddit's and on, you know, different forums. Do people even use forums anymore? Different uh, like Facebook groups and stuff. People talking about, you know, is, does this look bad for Microsoft or or what? What does this do for Microsoft? And I think, I think either way, no matter who was coming or who wasn't, I think Microsoft is going to have a hell of a year. Yeah. And there, uh, well, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of things that aren't for people like you and me who aren't into the ecosystem. But I think there might be some onboarding stuff that they that sure. I think I think this year will be the year that will be like. We gotta get an Xbox, or we gotta mm-hmm. we gotta get in on it. Sure. So. If they, I don't, you know, people are speculating. You know, we're going into an E three talk here. Speculating. It's a speculating. Sounds like me combining um, words. That uh, Microsoft is going to reveal their next Xbox at E three. I I don't think they do that anymore. Yeah. Well, they, in the past they, they they can be like there'll, there'll probably be some like nods and tinges to that, but. Uh, I don't think their E3, Microsoft's E3, is going to be contingent on that. I think uh, what Microsoft needs to do is come out and showcase these, these the streaming service that they mm-hmm. they may be, may be releasing in April or May, uh, showing how well that's going or how, how positive the reception is or why that's going to work so well. Uh, showing off maybe some of the, you know, uh, studios that are further along. Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe really, I mean, I would like to see it, maybe not at the press conference, but like a, like an in-depth, like, okay, w- initiative, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. Because they, I mean, I, I just, I'm just fascinated by what I, they're I, doing. I'm, it's too early. They don't, yeah, they don't, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Drew Murray just announced that he was a lead designer. Who's that? 
Um, he used to work for Insomniac. I can't remember exactly in what uh, capacity. In what capacity? But he was a designer at uh, Insomniac and uh, you know, worked on um, like resist the Resistance titles as mm-hmm. well as uh, the uh, Xbox exclusive one. Um, I just drew a blank on it. What oh, is Sunset Overdrive. Sunset Overdrive. Um, and so now, now he's the lead uh, lead designer over there at oh, the nice. initiative. That's so really cool. Really interested. About uh, what, what, what I would be afraid of is them showing like a sizzle reel of all the developers working on their stuff, and then we find out three years later that the one game everyone was hoping for gets canceled. Um, yeah, that that was a dig. At all EA. right, so. Um, that was a tangent that really didn't have anything to do with EA, well, but more about E3 in general. Yeah. Um, but continuing on, a Nintendo announces a Labo VR kit. If you're not familiar with the Labo, it's this cardboard construction you can put around your Switch, and you can do things with it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so they have announced a VR kit for the Switch. This is from Luke Plunkett at Kotaku. Coming out of absolutely nowhere, Nintendo has just announced a new virtual reality set for the Nintendo Switch, which will make use of the platform's Labo cardboard building concept. Coming out of... You no, pasted no. that twice. Sorry. That was it. That was it. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. there. I mean, I've seen the pictures. It looks ridiculous. Um, I think he probably pasted over something, and it's just gone. It's fine. Okay. Uh, it, not much to say there. My bad. Uh, but Nintendo's going to dip their toes. Basically, it looks like Google Cardboard yeah. for the Switch. Um, I don't know how good it's going to be. I think it'll be just it, as good as any of the other Labo stuff. The, pro- the problem with that is, you know, with the v- PSVR and uh, Oculus and everything, it says for not for kids under 12. Right. These Labo kits are technically, like, they're marketed for children. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, I I was and, thinking about that. Because no one's talked about that, really. Not to mention, the last time Nintendo dipped their toes in the VR, it did not end well for them. Oh, well, it's been quite a few years. Sure, but... but um, well, I noticed, uh, when you look at the uh, box art, or, like, the, the ads, it, none of the devices that you can build with them, I think except for one, you can wear. Okay. You, you, you hold them up to your face. So, so like, like a viewfinder. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, at least in the images, and the, this may not be the full case, but in the images, they show the kids holding them up to their face. So you could probably argue a workaround where, like, well, it's not permanently strapped. You know, it's not like strapped. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's about the strap for the kids, though. It's about the eyes. Well, I, well, no, it's not the strap. But I'm just saying, you're gonna be holding this, and then you're gonna be removing. Sure. It. I think the infrequency. Yeah, n- not as prolonged experiences. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm not interested in this. I'm not, no. we have a V, we have a PSVR that we don't touch. So, yeah. um, it might be, uh, if I find it one, I might put it on my face just to see what they're doing with it. But, that, but other than that, we're not interested. Moving on. <laughs> um, though the, there wasn't, uh, I did read the article before I posted it and I, I apologize. So go over and click on uh his if you're interested in the labo but it's not like you're going to be able to play like they're building specific games for it like they, right. they it's not like you're going to be able to yeah, play you mario turn or mario whatever, whatever yeah. into vr so um all right uh but con- continuing on the thread of nintendo uh they are reportedly asking mobile their mobile partners uh to stop players from spending so much this is from rebecca valentine at gamesindustry.biz and i've pulled like three ish paragraphs from the from the article uh but there's a whole lot more if you want even more uh context uh concerned concerned with its self-image nintendo has reportedly asked some of its mobile game development partners to adjust the microtransactions in their titles so that users won't overspend the wall street journal reports that sources at cyber agent which owns dragalia lost developer Psy games have asked the studio to adjust its microtransaction driven character lottery so players won't pour as much money into it trying to win rare characters. Nintendo, this is a quote, Nintendo is not interested in making a large amount of revenue from a single smartphone game, one cyber agent, cyber agent official reportedly said. If we managed the game alone, we would have made a lot more. The sources say that Nintendo is apparently worried it will be seen as greedy if players are spending too much. All of Nintendo's mobile games have been free to play to, or, free to, play or to start 
with microtransactions optional. So far, Nintendo hasn't made hasn't managed to produce a true mobile hit. Its first attempt, uh, Mitomo, was shut down only after two years. Nintendo president Tatsumi Kimishima said that Super Mario Run, a game that was free to start with a paywall for later levels, did not meet our expectations. Nintendo is currently working on two mobile games for 2019, Mario Kart Tour and Dr. Mario World. Uh, like I said, there's a, there's a lot more details about the specifics about which games are doing better or worse mm-hmm. over on the website, so go check that out. Um, I think one of the ones they mentioned is the um, Fire Emblem yeah. uh, Heroes. But interesting Mario Kart Tour and Dr. Mario World are coming to Switch, though. Or not Switch, to mobile. mobile. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Yeah. What do you think about um, about that? That whole idea that they're like, why don't you not make people spend money? Well, I, I think it's Nintendo's still trying to find their footing mm-hmm. in a mobile market. And instead of like appearing greedy and trying to cash in on one mobile hit and, and, and turning the you know fan base sour. Right. Like, right. you know, we're going to, we're going to scale back on some of this heavy, you know, microtransaction use. And we want you to come back to our games. Right. We don't, we don't want you to be afraid to download a Nintendo game because it's got all these micro microtransactions. You've got to spend $150 mm-hmm. just to get every character or whatever. So, I think once they kind of understand what they're doing in the space, um, that they're going to be less worried about yeah. that. They're going to be like, okay, this is how we can make money on all these different games. Mm-hmm. And so you won't feel like they're you know, nickel and diming you for everything in a single game, but you might be spending yeah. a lot more across several games. That's the first thing I thought of when I, when I just read the headline was that, well, you know, my mind thinks it works too fast for its own good. So... Uh, I was thinking, well, if they probably want you to spend money on multiple games rather than putting them all in in one. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my thought process, at least. Uh Uh-oh. Hi again. Sorry about that. We had some uh, technical technical difficulties or potential technical difficulties. But we're moving on to Vivendi. Josh, take it away. All right. Vivendi sells... Uh, Vivendi sells its remaining Ubisoft shares. This is from Brendan Sinclair over at GamesIndustry.biz. Uh, nearly a year after announcing, <clears throat> nearly a year after first announcing an end to its bid to acquire Ubisoft, Vivendi has sold uh, has sold off its in- final shares. I can't read. <laughs> I need any glasses? glasses. Can you blow that up a little bit? Uh, yes. Thank you. Whoa. Can you read that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, let me start over. Take two. And action. All right. Vivendi sells remaining Ubisoft shares from Brendan Sinclair at gamesindustry.biz. Nearly a year after first, an- first announcing an end to its bid to acquire Ubisoft, Vivendi has sold off its final shares in the Assassin's Creed publisher. As, as reported by Reuters... Vivendi today said it has sold off the last of its Ubisoft stake, representing about 5.9% of the company for 429 million euro dollar sign. That's not, is it, it's a C with an equal sign in the middle. I think that's euro. I don't know. It's it's not dollars. <laughs> so what, what they're saying is we should have tried to buy out Ubisoft. Yes. Um, at its peak, Vivendi owned... 30.5 million shares in Ubisoft, or about 27.3% of the company. Although it did not realize its ambitions to bring the publisher in-house, Vivendi clearly benefited from its investment. Reuters t- noted that Vivendi's total sales of Ubisoft shares brought in about $2 billion for a capital gain of $1.2 billion. Vivendi is no longer a Ubisoft shareholder and maintains its commitment to refrain from purchasing Ubisoft shares for a period of five years, the company said, adding that it is still looking to bolster its presence in the game industry. Vivendi previously owned Activision Blizzard, though it sold the company to an investment group led by Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick and co-chairman Brian Kelly in 2013 for $8.2 billion. Um, I think the rest is irrelevant. Um well. That was the rest. So, you know, this was a big deal Mm -hmm. a few years ago. We it it was, um, Vivendi was going to uh, perform a hostile takeover of 
the uh, Ubisoft. Is that how it's like objectively phrased? Uh, yeah, it was like, like it was going to be a hostile take takeover. That's a, that sounds like something that you say like. It, it, it's a well, bit, I mean, I'm not saying that you shouldn't say it. It's just that sounds so movie like that I have no idea what that it means. Continue. <clears throat> so for a time, Ubisoft wasn't doing fantastic. Mm-hmm. They were they were in a slump and. Vivendi was looking, was poising itself to take over the company and make it do what they wanted it to do. Mm-hmm. So they started going to different company places and buying up shares, and then they were going to. I mean, Vivendi has got a lot of stock in like mobile markets and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So that was a really big deal. And then Ubisoft CEO Yves Guillemont, like, came out in force was like, "Help us! We we don't want this. We don't want Vivendi to take over." We want to maintain control of our company and started doing things like sticking to franchises they built Mm -hmm. and continually improving them, making them better over time. We saw that with Watch Dogs and uh, Rainbow Six Siege and taking two years off of Assassin's Creed to come back and make what, you know, what some have called a return to form to Assassin's Creed or like reinvigorated the franchises mm-hmm. and i think it's shown in the last several years now that ubisoft is a very ha- has a very good idea of what it wants to do and people are uh being drawn to it yeah i you know i, I was thinking about this the other day about how many games in my life that i've been attracted to have been ubisoft yeah. games when at the in the same breath if someone were to like mention ubisoft to me if I'm separating like the titles from the company, mm-hmm. I think of Ubisoft as that weird uncle that you don't really talk to, mm-hmm. and it's like j- just like they're kooky and weird. They do things that are kind of bizarre, and you're like, yeah. okay, well that's Ubisoft doing Ubisoft. But then in the same breath, I have Assassin's Creed that I've loved, and uh, now The Division, yeah. and I mean, I mean, think of other games like Endgame. Um, or what, End War was the one I was oh, thinking yeah. of. Um, any Tom Clancy stuff. Splinter Cell. Splinter Cell. Um, the Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia. Yeah. Exactly. There's so many titles. It's like Ubisoft really is a really strong company. Oh, yeah. Um, and so it, it's weird because, like you said, I remember hearing these stories. But, again, I didn't really know what that meant, what it meant for this company to take them over. And then, like, I don't quite understand even today. And I don't know if <clears throat> you would know any more than I, but the process of what that process looks like for a company like say you were vivendi mm. i'm ubisoft and like if i'm not doing well you were all were you already a, a stakeholder and then h- how does me doing better prevent you i guess you buy your stocks back i guess so i don't know if i finished the thought there no you, i i get what you're, you're going for so if you have a publicly traded company like ubisoft and you're not doing particularly well, but you have a lot of resources. Mm-hmm. Your your stock your stock value may drop to a point where someone like Vivendi can come in and start buying up large sh- chunks. And so when it gets to a point where they can own either a majority of or mostly a majority of, they can force a vote to change leadership. Mm. And there's probably more technical than that, but... If if the majority of the shareholders are not satisfied with how the company is performing, if people aren't don't feel like their um, investments have been, you know, worth it, they can say, well, we we need a change. Mm-hmm. And if Vivendi owns most of that stock, or enough of it to be to push the vote over the edge, then they could hostile that they could perform the hostile takeover and I say see. and move the control of ubisoft to them mm-hmm. and say well we're going to make this company much better because we're going to go make a thousand mobile, mobile games, games and just churn money can you imagine you would you would cease to see ubisoft games yeah. like we see them so so that, that that's that's in a nutshell how that process would work and so just so as they as, so as they perf- got better and people spent more money and and they perf- and they uh, made their games better and people believed in them that means their value of those stocks increased making it harder to buy them in big chunks mm-hmm. 
Okay. That makes sense. We just believed in Ubisoft enough, and its heart grew three sizes. That's right. And again, you know, I'm not no like expert. So yeah, you are. You you just said you just spoke like an expert. You are the expert in stock trading now. Yes. If you have any questions, I've ask got him. a Robinhood account now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so moving away for a minute from uh, all that, uh, speculating on some rumors uh, for the PS4, uh, we have two. Um, first, well, not, we we have two items about the PS4. One's a rumor. One just happened. Let me let me start there. So. First, the PS4 firmware update 6.5 released and adds remote play for iOS devices. Uh, the, the write-up comes from Stephen Talby, Talby at Push Square. Uh, this is just a rundown of what the patch did. Uh, there's two significant things that it did. Uh, first, the new, the biggest new inclusion is... And one significant thing it didn't do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully that'll come out at 7, yeah. but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so PS4 firmware 6.5 is now ready and available for download. Uh, the biggest new inclusion is that the remote play is now supported on iOS smartphones and tablets. You'll need to download the app from the App Store, simply named PS4 Remote Play, and you'll be able to use the feature on all your uh, favorite Apple products. Unfortunately, and this is a big unfortunately, DualShock 4 controllers aren't supported yet, so you'll need a compatible pad to use remote play on your iOS device. Um, other than that, there's not much to see. There's a patch notes tell of... This one I thought was kind of interesting, except I don't know what this is. Uh, the patch notes tell of a new option for Nico Nico live users to output your broadcast at 720, and the rumored ability to swap the functions of the circle and X button is indeed included, although in only in certain countries. That part was what I was interested in. Is that related to the Nico Nico, or is that separate? I, I have no idea what Nico Nico is. So what that is saying... In Japan, the, the, their uses for the X and O buttons are swapped. Clearly, because that's the problem so, with Kingdom So Hearts if 3. you were to import games or a device from Japan, those those inputs are different. Oh. So like your select and cancel buttons are reverse of what you would normally expect. So it could lead you to accidentally purchasing something when you were trying to go back. Oh. Or in a game, accidentally backing out of a menu instead of accepting the menu. I see. So now they've added the option to flip those buttons in the UI, okay. which is nice. I mean, I haven't had that problem, but I've heard of that problem. Okay. Right. Um, and then I have tried the iOS app, uh, and it's, I mean, if you are in a pinch and you really need to, get, need to go collect uh, your exotics from Xur or need to upload your mobile save data if you're playing ps4 somewhere else it's useful uh it obviously turns like none other i played uh, while I sitting in the same room as my playstation 4 i was streaming kingdom hearts 3 and it was like no yeah no i, I don't think it mentioned it here but you also m have to be on wi-fi so you can't do this over your cellular network oh i didn't know that and he says you might you'll have to you'll need a compatible pad but i'm pretty sure it's not it's not compatible with any device. Well, I think it's saying, like, you you might be able to connect something to your iOS device that would act as those buttons. Okay. Uh, which would be kind of like having a controller to control your phone, which would then control the app. I don't know. I, I, it didn't elaborate too much, and I'm just speculating. So, so, speculating. So, the big thing is missing here is you can't use a DualShock 4, which is a big miss. Mm -hmm. And there's no Android. Uh, right. app so that's sorry guys you know at least 50 percent of the market right and then and, and like you said the streaming isn't isn't great yet mm. so if you have a like <coughs> i would recommend if you have it if you have a laptop you can do it on mac os i don't know if you can do it on standard well you, i mean that's always been you, i mean that's been around for a while you can right. download the remote play and play it from PC. okay yeah i mean so you, you can still do that and then you know or use your vita if you still have a vita is that's one thing it was always good for. Uh, and the other uh, PS4 news, real quick, is uh, so actually PS5 rumors. And then we'll jump back up. I'm skipping around. Um, PS5 new PS5 details hint at more adaptable and customizable customizable consoles. This is from Liana Rupert at ComicBook.com. This looked interesting. I'm not uh, read through this. I'm not. I'm not really sure what they're trying to do here. Yeah, but it sounds. Interesting. Well, I'll read through it and then you kind of. Okay, so speculate. <laughs> um, thanks, so speculate. Thanks to YouTube. Word of the day. Yeah. 
Uh, thanks to YouTuber Skullzy and his incredible attention to detail regarding the business dealings of, of Sony, a new patent seems to suggest that the PlayStation 5 is centered around an algorithm that basically programs itself. What does this mean? Here's a potential of what the latest patent could possibly be revealing. Customized game UI to user experience. Reading, analyzing, and changing according to player playstyle. Uh, game gameplay experience evolution on an individual basis. Um, what makes this new information interesting is that if it if it in fact if this is in fact what it looks like, this could be a total game chamber for changer for devs on how they interact with fans through their games. Open world RPGs will suddenly be much more impactful than they already are in games that rely on behavioral patterns such as Red Dead's Karma system and Mass Effect's Renegade Paragon system. From everything we've learned so far about what's supposedly on the way, including a focus on VR and backwards compatibility, it's hard not to get excited about what's next on the horizon for both Microsoft and Sony. Um, we still don't have any concrete details, uh, release window for PS5 or the next Xbox, though an official reveal is heavily expected to take place this year for Microsoft Camp. But, of course, that's just a rumor. And, of course, as always, patents are to be taken with a grain of salt because... People patent the crap out of everything just so no one else yeah. does it. I don't know. I'm starting to get a little skeptical about all these like patents coming out left patents and right, and these rumors and hypothetical things. Well, like the thing that always gives me pause. I mean, is, we've talked about it before. Every time a new console comes out, it's it's always the pipe dream. There's mm -hmm. a pipe dream of what is this console going to be, and the more and more we hear about it, the less I'm like, this sounds this sounds too like. In the weeds, like I, I, I don't I don't really mm. know what this would do mm. or means. Like, w w why would the system have that? I, I don't understand. I technology guess like to that. changing the like adhering the way Do it responds to you based on how you use the game. But but the but the games react to the, what the system is reading. Yeah. Or is the system just giving? Is there enough horsepower in the system that allows the games to? Yeah, I, we're, it's we're, all French. Yeah, it's all French. So um, I, I don't know what to think about that. I think, I think we just at this point we need to slow down on these rumors and let Sony have have the word. Yeah, whenever they want to talk. Mm -hmm. So agreed. I think the, the thing that every time we read one of these, it always starts with thank you to YouTuber Skullzy or thank you for Redditor XX Xuge or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how can we take any of that seriously? Yeah. So, I don't know. We'll see when we see. We shall see. Um, I think this is the last story on our No. Docket. We have this one. We have... We got a few more. Okay. Four more. Well, we can skip this one. Or we can skip this one. Nah, let's just go through them real quick. Okay. All right. Um... <coughs> Octopath Traveler, Champions of the Continent, announced for iOS and Android by Square Enix from Giuseppe from Twinfinite. Uh, Nelva from Twinfinite. Last year, Square Enix released Octopath Traveler to great acclaim from fans and critics on the S Nintendo Switch. Now it's preparing to launch a mobile version. The version for iOS and Android has just been announced and will be released within 2019. It will be called, titled, Octopath Traveler... Tairiku no Hasha, which translates to the Champions of the Continent. The, ga the game will retain its HD 2D graphics and will mostly operate in the same way as the original on Switch, even if the, cons uh, even if the controls have been adapted in order to be easy to use on smart devices. With the implementation of touch controls and on-rail movements that let you simply decide the direction you want to move. The story is set in the still set in the continent of Ostera, but several years before the original. That being said, the characters from the Switch version will also appear in some form. One of the main departures from the original is that the number of characters partici participating in battle has been increased to eight. There will also be additional characters, even if the game will launch with eight. There will also be additional characters, even if the game will launch with eight, one per region. That's a weird statement. Mm -hmm. Uh, on top of that, the development team has plans to add more story content peri periodically. As most 
as most mobile games, Octopath Traveler Champions of the Continent continent will be free to play with optional purchases. Interest too many purchases. Though. Interestingly, <coughs> uh, for a mobile game, there will be there will not be multiplayer. This is entirely a single player experience. Wow. Um, I thought I heard that it was. Um, I, I didn't see it in the article. I thought I heard that it was only releasing in Japan at the moment. I, I have heard that too. So, um, um, we'll, we'll keep you updated on that. Um, I didn't get a, pl- a chance to get very deep into Octopath Traveler, but I did play a couple hours of it. I, think. I played the, when the, the the open or the, the, the demo. The demo was like thirty minutes or an hour, and I thought it was really nice. Mm-hmm. It's a really beautiful yeah. yeah art style. So it's a game that I I know I would like if I could sit down and play it, but I just haven't yet. Haven't. Too many games. Too many games. And more coming up for you to replay. If you are an Xbox fan, and if you liked Halo, well then, you your, your day is getting is getting better. Uh, Halo Master Chief Collection is coming to PC and adds Halo Reach. This is from Ethan Gatch over at Kotaku. Halo the Master Chief Collection will soon, will soon include Halo Reach and be available on the Windows Store and Steam, Microsoft announced today during its Inside Xbox live stream. Rather than making rather than make every game in the co- collection available all at once on PC, Microsoft has said the collection will roll out one game at a time, uh, starting with Halo Reach and going in chrono- chronological order from there. Microsoft is pitching this incremental approach as a way to make games available sooner rather than waiting until the entire collection is ready. The games will run at 60 frames per second and support 4K. On Xbox One, Halo Reach multiplayer will be available as a free add-on for everyone who already owns the collection, while the single-player campaign will cost extra. Halo Reach does not have a release date on either PC or console. At launch, the Master Chief Collection consisted of uh, Halo, Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo 4. In 2015, 343 Industries added Halo 3 ODST to the collection. The addition of Halo Reach means it will be it will soon contain every Halo shooter except for Halo 5, and that every game in the series will be available on Xbox Game Pass. That's huge. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, this is good looking for all of them, and you know maybe we'll finally play some Halo games if it comes to PC. Yeah. And Game Pass, uh, more specifically. Uh, I Halo is one of those that, like, knowing that I enjoy playing Destiny so much, I wonder how much of that came from halo oh like, yeah and for how, sure like the character design and the world building and stuff i like played that. a l- very very small amount of halo on the xbox and i don't remember it it didn't grab me but th- you know that was a time i wasn't really playing first person shooters yeah um i wasn't interested in them so i'd be interested to go back and play them and m- we might get a chance with it coming to pc cool yeah um it sounds more like though uh they're releasing one at a time so they can uh, make sure their servers don't die. Yeah. That's well, well what, what I mean, what they said made sense is like if, you know, making all these games, mm-hmm. you know, like when they're done, pop them out. Sure. Pop them out. Um, strange that they're going to give uh, Halo Reach like the multiplayer for free, but you got to pay for. Yeah. Uh, w- with as like, you know, struggled as that uh, release has been over the last several years. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, they already added three ODST, right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it makes sense that they would have to pay a little bit more for another yeah, game. Yeah, I don't know. But still cool. Um, cool. All right. Take it away. Devil May Cry 5 is Capcom's second UK number one of 2019. This is from Chris Mer- Christopher Dring at Game in- GamesIndustry.biz. Again, <clears throat> they're they get they getting the scoops this week. Yeah, Anthem's reign at the top of the UK charts has charts has ended. I thought I thought they weren't doing good in the UK. No, what it was is that Anthem had performed less than uh, the last Mass Effect, but was still okay. The top selling game. So it sounds to me like UK games are just not selling very well. Yeah. Anyway, so Anthem's reign at the top of the UK charts has ended with Devil May Cry 5 jumping straight to the summit. It's Capcom's second number one of the year following the great su- following the success of Resident Evil 2. <clears throat> and the game matches the number one achievement of DMC Devil May Cry in 2013. The launch sales between the two DMC games are almost identical 
Although, as always, these charts do not include download data, and considering the rise of digital sales, we can assume this new game has outperformed the 2013 reboot. <coughs> Devil May Cry 5 has performed best on PS4, with Sony's console accounting for 80% of the physical sales. EA's Anthem, therefore, lo loses its number one position and actually slips to number four with a 62% sales drop week on week. Red Dead Redemption 2 ju jumps three places back to number two with 3% sales increase, while Mario Kart, 8 Deluxe, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe races five places to number three. Mar Mario Kart 8 actually reached number three despite dropping 4% in sales week on week. Which just goes to highlight <laughs> what a slow week it was it has been for UK games re retail. Yeah, what I was just saying. And so the top uh, the top ten this week in the UK, remember. <coughs> and this doesn't sp specify platform or anything like that, but just the uh, top selling game titles. Number one, Devil May Cry Five. Number two, Red Dead Redemption Two. Number three, Mario Kart Eight Deluxe. Number four, Anthem. Number five, FIFA Nineteen. Uh, number six, Far Cry New Dawn. Number seven, The Lego Movie 2, the video game. Number eight, uh, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Number nine, Metro Exodus. And number ten, Grand Theft Auto V. The gift that keeps on giving. Always. Um, so, yeah, I want to include that one because uh, we haven't really talked a whole lot of Devil May Cry because neither of us are Devil May Cry fans. But I wanted uh, not uh, – we just don't play them. I uh, played three. I mean, it confused me because I felt like – I like. I felt like I got to the final boss, but it also felt like there was a whole other side of the game that I was supposed to play that I couldn't figure out how to play, hmm. and I just got frustrated and quit. So. Um, I've heard really great things about this one, but uh, of course, if you're into Devil May Cry, then you already know if you like this one or not. It's also uh, in the same engine as the Resident Evil 2 remake, that, and apparently, I mean, I've seen it. It looks incredible. Yeah, it does. It the really character does. models are in incredible. So, if you're interested in that, I mean... I'm kind of interested in it. But. Yeah, I mean, I thought about downloading the demo and his action game. And that might be a summer game. We'll get it yeah. on sale or something when we finally slow down from the craziness going on. Yeah. And unless, last but not least. Unless potential Borderlands 3 announcement further teased by Gearbox for PAX East 2019. Uh, is this your turn? Uh, it's all right. hey, you can talk it. You can talk it. I can talk it. Uh, from Colin Stevens at IGN. Um, Gearbox has teased its upcoming PAX East 2019 main theater show with a new image that undoubtedly points to something Borderlands related appearing at the show, which would be fine. Uh, w which would line. Which would line. I can't read it that small again. I don't know what happened to my eyes. I think it's your screen. It probably is my screen. Uh, which would line up with heavy speculation of a proper Borderlands 3 announcement. Gearbox's teaser image... <coughs> Te Gearbox's teaser says, image teases the March 28th show in Boston, Massachusetts with a stylized cel-shaded highway sign set in a desert area. The sign also bears the marker Exit 3. The style of the image is certainly based in the Borderlands franchise art style. Of course, that doesn't necessarily confirm Borderlands 3, but given the high anticipation for the long-discussed sequel, the Exit 3 tease and Gearbox's marquee presence at PAX East the time it would make sense for a proper unveiling. So so there you go, Borderlands fans. There's another game that we just never got into. Yeah. Um, that, that, that still released around the time where I was anti cell shaded Yeah. And I, I was also not a first-person shooter. Again, Yeah. Bef before Destiny, really, I wasn't a big first-person shooter player, and I didn't care for cell shaded So it j just in no mm -hmm. way spoke to me. Yeah. But after playing Destiny and talk, a lot of the pe people in my clan came from Borderlands and said th that's that's why they love Destiny because it's it's got the same kind of loot, the the loot system, where I mean, Borderlands was you know pitched as the game with infinite guns. Yeah. Because it, you could just have an amalgamation of, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I that's I I played a little bit of Borderlands two on the Vita when it was ported. And uh, it, it it ran really poorly and all that stuff. So I didn't really get a good look at it. But I was about to say, it feels like it was like a single player looter shooter. Like, yeah. exactly that. But I also, weirdly to say, can't imagine. Well, I can't imagine. I don't know how interesting a looter shooter without the social mechanic in there would be anymore not to say that not to say it won't be 
but mm-hmm. I feel like that's part of it. Uh, you know, Destiny is a collection game, mm-hmm. and you want to show off your collection. You want to, oh, you got Merciless, uh, mm-hmm. Merciless. Well, I got Merciless and Nameless Midnight. Just kidding. Everyone gets Nameless Midnight. But the idea of that collection yeah. building. Well, I mean, you, you wouldn't have games like Diablo if <clears throat> you couldn't play a single player. But there's multiplayer components to Diablo. That's true, but not always. That hasn't always been the case, has it? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Think I always so. thought it was a it was an MMO. But I mean, people loved Borderlands, and you know, Borderlands Two, I think, was the first one to add uh, any kind of co-op component. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, um, but speaking as, of games as a service, sort of um, talking about looter shooters and shared worlds and Gas. stuff like this gas yeah i've seen it typed out like that that and uh, like, i don't know how i feel about that <laughs> anyway uh this week i wanted to talk a little bit about the division two uh and also talk about these are not necessarily related but the topic of the week is what would make a perfect games as a service or if you're using like a 10 point scale what would make a games as a service a 10 out of 10 um or maybe even a 9 out of 10 uh because uh as we've spoken on the last few, I mean, the last week's episode was called "Everybody Hates Anthem." Mm-hmm. You know, we have we've had Destiny one and two, and uh, the first division, and now Anthem. Can you think of any other live games like that? They're, I mean, they're not the only ones, but I'm not, I'm not including Battle Royale. Uh, well, I mean, you have like Warframe and okay, Warframe. Um, I mean, you'd still have uh, Final Fantasy XIV. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, whatever. Uh, point being, we, we've in the in recent. I think that falls more into the MMO camp, which mm-hmm. is a games of service, but it's not really what we're talking about here. Yeah, and Monster that, Hunter that, World. Monster Hunter World kind of is. Mm-hmm. That one still falls in the uh, in a in a weird spot. Yeah, but uh, the point my point that I'm trying to get across is. Um, all of these games, uh, aforementioned games, came out with really bad press, um, uh, and 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 varying degrees. You know, yeah. Vanilla Destiny. You know, everyone always says Vanilla Destiny uh, was you know content light. That's usually like the the markers of the conversation. Whether it's content light, if the end game is good, if the the weapons are balanced and the story made no sense the story blah, 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 whatever blah. and all of those things are valid criticisms and you know both times well division had destiny had this twice because they had two games where they seem to have the same maybe not the same issue but the conversation felt the same as like it wasn't until mm. taken king that <clears throat> D- division or destiny one really came into its own and uh i guess one could argue that it wasn't until forsaken that Destiny 2 really came into its own. Right. It's weird that it takes the third in expansion in both to... Well, I guess that does make sense. Cause it was the first big expansion. That's true. That's true. Um, but I, I really just want to know I, uh, your your opinion on, and my opinion on, for this, for that matter, what would make game uh, games as a service come out 10 out of 10? Like, what do you, what, what do you think those criteria are? I don't know. I, that's such a subjective. If I mean, if you're asking me mm-hmm. what I think, if I were to give out a 10 rating, what I would need, um, what what I was looking at Destiny to be. Okay. And what were you wanting Destiny <clears throat> to be before uh, you got into now, it? Now, I love Destiny. I don't have, I never really had a problem with the story or the dialogue. Even that just didn't bother me. I didn't have a problem with Dinklebot. Um, I would never played a game like this, so Destiny mm-hmm. One didn't feel content light. I played the crap out of it. You know, we were grinding up to level thirty. Finally, got to level thirty, and you had to fight level thirty-two enemies and Crota. And I just I enjoyed every bit of it. Mm-hmm. And then when it when we ran out of things to do, I, I didn't feel like well the game sucks now. It just felt like I've spent three hundred, four hundred hours playing this game. It's all right to go take a break, mm-hmm. uh, you know. So, I, I, my perfect ten doesn't necessarily mean what's gonna what you know. IGN is gonna rate a perfect ten, but I think it would have to be the story was solid. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, if you took Mass Effect two story 
and married it with a gameplay loop like Destiny, <clears throat> where nothing, where playing with somebody was seamless. Mm -hmm. It felt natural to be in a cutscene with someone else and then not feel forced or like awkward. Um, <clears throat> that you could play it by yourself and still feel powerful and not miss out on 90% of the content because you don't have a friend, you don't have a friend or you don't want to play with other people. Um, it, again, with the games of service, it's our right to not be able to play everything because you know, you, you hmm. either to play a raid, you need six people mm -hmm. talking and communicating. So that kind of stuff is kind of required. But if I can play through the story by myself, and it's a solid story, if I could play with another person, and for some reason they talk to me like I'm the chosen one, but we're both out going out there doing it, like in uh, Anthem or Destiny, where <clears throat> in Anthem they're like saying like the the freelancers are like rare nowadays, and you're like the only, one of the only freelancers around, and then you go out and do a mission, and there's four of you all of a sudden, yeah. and they're not really talking about the fact that there's like like a group of freelancers that have just moved into town or something. Yeah, yeah. And same with Destiny. Like, you are the chosen one. You've you've done all these amazing things, but you know, then Lord Saladin doesn't know your name at the beginning of Destiny Two, even though you're now an hour Iron Lord from Destiny. There, there's things like that, mm -hmm. and then you go into a cutscene. And you you've got like six guardians, but they don't like. Mm-hmm. Going together. Well, they don't go in together, but you don't. You're not like standing there with Zavala. With mm -hmm. six guardians or three guardians after the thing, and it's like you just did all this. You went and recruited two random guardians, mm -hmm. but you are the guardian. But the, so so are the other two. Yeah, there, there's a weird disconnect in that sense. Uh, I think it also has pro another problem to do with this silent silent protagonist, where they don't have any conversations. So th yeah. that's where I would go. I, I need my protagonist to be a protagonist to actually talk to interact and not. Destiny Destiny does this terribly where like it is making fun of itself that the fact that she doesn't talk mm -hmm. my character like Cade is asking you to answer him mm -hmm. and you can talk you've talked before this is a serious moment he needs you to talk Cade is dying and he wants you to say something and the only time you say something is after he's dead like the, yeah, that kind of stuff would instantly drop a score to nine. Like, there's, it just feels so bad. Mm -hmm. So that kind of stuff. Um, so the story on point, you could play it with the, with friends. You could you could play it solo, and nothing feels out of place. And then the story is as solid as uh, like a Mass Effect. And then you go out and do a, a gameplay loop like Destiny, where you're collecting gear. All the gear feels important and special. And yeah, uh, so and the, the, obviously servers. I mean, yeah, yeah. That, the technical stuff kind of goes without saying. If you can launch a game flawlessly, you know, in the next five years, that that would you know put pu push you up in mm -hmm. the like in the in the games of service realm. Mm -hmm. I uh, I would agree agree with what you say because <clears throat> uh, story wise, I, I feel like regardless if you are with one person or you're with 10 or four mm -hmm. <clears throat> the story should feel the same yeah um and I, but, the, but the thing is like do you, this is this is a rhetorical question do you want the game to be like hey you guys or if you're by yourself like hey you um like would i wonder if if that would be the solution or just don't make the game contingent on the fact that you are the chosen one well yeah I, the chosen one mentality are like I mean, it can be up to your group. You can be bad company or mm -hmm. whatever. But if you're not playing with a group, then give you a squad. Yeah. Like, m make it seem like, okay, you're going in with three, four other people. You know, choose, like, three AI characters. Or, you know, Anthem does this really where, well where you can just match make with mm -hmm. three people. You don't have to talk with them. It, yeah. it tells you clearly what to do, even if it's very simple. Um and so you don't need that heavy communication. And if if it requires heavy communication or a, a, a task that would normally require heavy communication to circumvent that mm -hmm. by being very clear in the you know UI or 
and the tool tips or like what they're telling you to do that you don't need necessarily that yeah. at least for the story right. components of it. And I think what Anthem tried to do I, I'm not played much of the story. I've only heard heard from other, you know, content creators and stuff talking about it. So I can't comment on how it does, but just seeing like if it's good or not, but just seeing like from what I have played the story they they've tried to separate the story from the gameplay enough to where it's supposed to feel natural, but I almost feel it feels more unnatural to me. Yeah. It's like, okay, you can go into Fort Tarsus and explore the story at your own pace or whatever, uh, but then if you do a story mission, you can do that with other people, but the results of that are still based on what you do inside Fort Tarsus, not anything you do outside in the world. I think I, I'm kind of BSing this sort of, but yeah, I agree. Like it should it should meld pretty seamlessly, and uh, um, the 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 thing i always want uh and this is what when i first started playing destiny what i had a hard time with is i couldn't really quite figure out what we were doing or why or the information that i wanted to know out of the game by the time you jumped in it was like well uh, oh this this is a really good example the first time i ever played destiny i think it was the first night we were playing uh it was just you and me it may have been shack or something like that um we were playing and we were running through a mission, and then you you kept you or Shaq kept um, triggering the event for the next thing to happen, and I was like, "But I wanted to do it," and you were like, "Well, that, that's just not how it works. You just run through and kill the thing." But I'm like, "Well, then, what am I doing? I'm not hearing the story beat from the ghost. I'm not hearing. I don't know why I'm pressing this button." And so it took me a long time to realize, like, to change perspective of this isn't really. A story that I need to consume the same way I, I consume um, a first per- a different first person shooter. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> excuse me, I talk too fast. I can't forget to breathe. Um, so I but I think there's room for that. Yeah. Um, and, and what what I wanted out of Destiny when I first played was to start to care about why I'm having the ghost search inside the the machine to trigger or something, you know? And I wanted to know, but, but then I found out half the stuff I wanted to know. I had to read Gilmore. Gil- Grimoire. Grimoire. You don't have to read the Gilmore girls. <laughs> just no. the Grimoire cards. Grimoire cards. And then I'm like, well, that's really you interesting. You just listen to my name is by. He tells yeah, you. Well, and, and so, and there's all that, but so okay, we got story. Um, and then the gameplay loop. Um, I think, like you said, has to be fun. And I think that's what, uh, Destiny. I think we spoke. I don't know if I said it on the show. I think we. Had, I think we did. Did we? That I thought it has a very exceptional reward reward system. Yeah. Uh, because in Anthem, you kind of see that you have something hanging around, but mm-hmm. uh, it, it's weird. And Division does it a little better, uh, where you at least have these pillars around. But with when when in Destiny, when you pop the head off the bad guy and you see the orb fall out, it's just like yeah. it's just like perfect. That that and. In Destiny, all the weapons have names. Yeah. And so, like, you know when you got Gallarhorn. You mm-hmm. know when you got uh, Dire Promise or... No, no, Dire Promise for me. I like that. Or Promise. Edge Transit. Edge Transit. Or Edge Transit. Or <laughs> Edge Transit. Um, I was trying to think of... I, I, it, it slipped my mind. The Fatebringer. Oh. Oh, Fatebringer. Um, Vault of Glass hand cannon. That was... So great! Every time you got a headshot, they exploded. Oh really? Oh, it was fantastic. That's you, awesome. If you do, you remember doing the Crota's End raid, uh, where you it starts off, you just drop down into the pit and you got to run through the darkness, mm-hmm. and you're getting surrounded by thrall. If you're down there with a fate bringer, you just hit one with the fate bringer, and then like there's just explosions everywhere. Oh, that's awesome! And you have six people just shooting fate bringers. Mm-hmm. It's just like explosion Fireworks. fests. Yeah, uh, yeah. So and so when. It's weird to think about what we want because we've been so happy with what we've had. Yeah. Uh, eventually. Um, but I, I can tell, I mean, I've been really happy with Destiny, but I can tell, it's not a 10 out of 10. Okay. It doesn't have this, it doesn't, it, it has the, uh, the opportunity. I mean, Bungie is really good at story as far as the lore, but they haven't quite delivered in, in, the, in Destiny the Mass Effect, mm-hmm. like, 
the the deep story, and they're getting there. There's some really interesting things going on in Destiny uh, behind the scenes, especially right now with the Drifter. Things I'm hearing about what's going on with him and the Nine, and then uh, you know, did you know Marasov and uh, the Queen? No, yeah, Marasov the Queen and Shax used to, you know, really? Yeah, <laughs> Shax. Yeah, interesting. Amazing Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> That was amazing. <laughs> uh, <sighs> With the helmet on. <laughs> At least she has something to hold on to. Uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, so so there's that. But I wanted to bring in The Division 2 with this. And now you of haven't course. played any of this yet, I, other than the open other, beta. I've, other than the open beta, I didn't, I've not got a chance to play it, and I probably will not get a chance to play it tonight. No, it's past your bedtime. Uh, I, I, it, I've only played five hours of it, oh, which you can see all of them, all of those five hours on the stream, twitch.tv slash where gaming underscore. If you want to just have it run in somewhere, that'd be fine. Um, but I, I can't say yet that it is a 10 out of 10. Uh, uh, it is beautiful. There are a lot of beautiful textures, a, a very beautiful world. Uh, there is the the story. It it is more present than the first division. Okay. But I still don't quite know beat by beat, like what what the ultimate goal is. I mean, obviously the ultimate goal is save Washington D.C. Sure. You have these factions who are, you know, who have taken over and just like in any Ubisoft game or whatever, you reclaim territory. You do all this, you do all that. That I get. But like I don't really know a whole lot about who these hyenas are and how they came to be and or, or like uh, like the first mission you do is you save uh someone's daughter. Mm-hmm. Um who's at this who's at the settlement camp. Uh but I can't remember the names or anything like that. But again, I, ju- I just started and I don't know how, what, what is going to, what kind of impression is going to leave on me. Sure. But the way it integrates it though, um, mm. with the open world is like seamless. Yeah. I, literally to the point where when, I mean, and this was something in the division one that I always found interesting. Uh, and it's, it's back in division two is like, um, you know, in destiny and in Anthem, you always lo- like load to these different zones, zones, and 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 it, and it makes sense in those games, or at least I'll, I'll speak more about Destiny. It makes sense that you know you're flying, or you you know you're you have to fly to another planet, fly to another planet, <coughs> and do all these things. But when you're in Destiny, when you're if you're teamed up and you're you're doing a a raid or just a mission or whatever, a, a strike at the end, you know you have all your scores and stuff like that. Um, but in this one, and there may be that in the PvP, but in, in in division, you just end and you have your squad, and if you've match mate with some squads, then you get to keep them, mm-hmm. uh, unless you decide to disband after the mission, and just lets you back out in the world in one instance together. Um, and if you go to your main, if you go to your base of operations or your or your your hub, or whatever that is a safe zone or whatever, you, you don't have to load in there. You just walk walking. in there. And that walking path, I've no one's ever told me this. Like, I don't know for sure that this is what it is, but it's the only thing that makes sense to me, is that the reason why you walk a little slower than you do is that it's taking time to load up well, yeah. what's going on in the world or whatever. It just It's just... Is it still that slow? And No, you can run. Uh, you can't, like, all out run, but you can toggle, a, like, a brisk jog or okay. whatever like that because man it was like swamp well, it, it, it was like the bog you know, just yeah waders waist deep you can't mm-hmm. move your legs walking through those like yeah. buffer zones much better um and then um, i got a, i got a really important question okay how's alex doing i have not met alex i think he's gone alex is dead alex is dead all of the uh, Al- you, uh, we've killed all of the Alex. I think they if if we haven't killed them all, they just stayed in New York. Um, that's all I know. So because I mean the population of Alex in New York was must have been like ninety nine percent Alex, 
and we killed them all. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've not I've not met any Alexes um, in the game. In the game, not yet. Uh, uh, is there a new? Is there a new uh, uh, major enemy? No. Um, do you mean like in a joking way? Like yes. any, any any names? Uh, I have not heard names being yelled out as much. Uh, it's been more like they got him, or or stuff like that. But they've not gotten. It's not you know names and stuff like sure. that. Sure. Um, do they rep- is the is the variety of lines? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, and of course it also depends on what group of people you're fighting. Right now, I've only really been fighting the hyenas because that's in the territory I'm in. But it, I've gone out to a different territory, and you have the three sons, or not, the free sons, I think is what they're called. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're more of a task force than the hyenas, which are more like drug gang. Um, the task force, it's not like tactical or anything, but they, they're a little bit heavier equipped. And then you have the hyenas. And the, the hyenas scare me more than the, the sons because the hyenas... They're not really trained in any of the fighting, and so they'll come at come up to you and just start whacking you like crazy. And then uh, the it's it was so interesting. It's even in their body posture, how they fight. Um, like th- they just kind of like swing the guns, and then they'll come up to you and be like da, 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 and, and all this stuff. And it really freaks me out sometimes because uh, I hear footsteps from coming up from, from behind me, and they like get three of them with bats or and and they use their drug as an enhancing mechanism for them. So you'll have an enemy that just looks like a standard red bart enemy mm-hmm. and then you they'll have a bag of like drugs with them and they'll like you'll see a pill symbol will go above their head they'll take it and then they'll, suddenly they become berserkers and rush you so you you have an opportunity to stop them from becoming rush not all of them some of them are always rushers yeah but it changes and so that's really cool um so, so i i'm not trying to make this a division segment but that's what i've been playing and and it so far, being I'm level seven, a handful of hours into it, it's really polished. There's yeah. a really there's a lot there's pop ins and chugging and stuff it, like if, that. If it stays like it is, could you say it's a ten? No, no. Uh, if it stays like it is, I mean, I I don't I can't see it getting any lower than an eight. Okay. Um, the si- silent protagonist is real in this game. Uh, and it's, oh, yeah. it's not as bad as destiny where it's like, answer me. I'm literally talking to you, but it'll be like you, like you're being shepherded in, like you're in a settlement. You just saved this girl's daughter, this woman's daughter. And the person who told you about the daughter is with you. You've rescued the daughter. You're here. And then I think her name was agent Kelso. You and agent Kelso go in to see the mom. And then the mom, or Agent Kelso, leaves. He's like, I'm going to step outside. So you're just, it's just you and the character, the, mm-hmm. the, um, the mom. And then it's like, it's awkward for a minute. And I'm like, well, I guess this, you could, you could, this could be bought as like just an awkward silence because you don't know who she is and you just saved her daughter. And then the mom talks to you says, thank you for doing this all. I won't forget about it. But then he keeps talking about other world-based things that I feel like your character would respond to that she doesn't. Yeah. So there's an argument to be made that she didn't need to. Uh, she, because my yeah. character is a she. Uh, but there are, I can already tell there will be instances where it's like, why didn't you say something? So, yeah. And it's a very similar situation to Destiny's or, or uh, free, uh, um, Anthem where it's like, you are the division, a- division agent. Um, but you do a a thing with a crew of division agents. Now sure. there are other division agents in the world that are characters like, Oh, you go and save this division agent because she was here for a while, but she got captured or mm-hmm. something like that. But they're not doing the same thing that you're doing. So anyway, I highly recommend division. We got the early access uh, for pre-ordering. So i um, super excited to see what everyone else thinks about it and what you think about it when yeah. you get to it. I'll get a chance to play it this week and we'll bring in my thoughts. Yeah. Uh, so I think that about wraps, wraps it up this week. Uh, we I uh, just need to tell you the uh, games coming out for next week. Uh, remember, you can always find us on uh, Twitter at WearGaming underscore and on Twitch.tv slash WearGaming underscore. And uh, write in to weekly at WearGaming.com. Yeah. So next week, the games are Dramatic Pause. 
Today is the 13th. Um, okay, what's next Wednesday? Out this week. Uh, well, uh, the Division 2 is officially released yeah, boy. on uh, PC, PS4, Xbox One on March 15th. This Friday. Uh, Fenimore, Fillmore. Fenim- Fenimore, Fillmore, Three Skulls of the Toltecs p- on PC, March 15th. A Lego Mar- Marvel Collection on PS4 and Xbox One on March 15th. One Piece World Seeker on PC, PS4, and Xbox One, March 15th. On March 19th, you have Fate slash Extella Link on PC. The Sinking City on PC, PS4, Xbox One. Is that another area of Destiny? Yeah, the Sinking, sinking city. city. You have the... They have the Dreaming City okay. and the Sinking City. Yeah. No, uh, the Sinking City, PS4, PC, Xbox One on March 21st. Oh, well, that's that's past next week. Oh, well, 19th then is we'll repeat it next week. All right. So thank you again for tuning in. Yeah, thanks. And uh, yeah, come check us out come, on Twitch. Uh, we'll be streaming a lot of Division. And Destiny. I and Destiny. I want to get back to the Destiny. Yeah, for sure. So, All right. Have a good week. Bye, Nick.